Alright, so welcome to the end of the semester. This is our last topic we'll be discussing. And so this is going to be an extra credit assignment, so all the uh, responses that you do on Canvas on the quiz, I'll go on and hand grade and assign points on correct answers. Any points you obtain will be extra credit. So desert ecosystems is the topic. And geology has a lot to do with desert ecosystems because mountain ranges create deserts. And a lot of reasons where deserts lie where they are is in part due to geology. Springs we find in deserts, areas called oases, where there are sources of water, due to geology, most of the, mostly geological faults or change in type of a geological strata. So one of the things I want you to know for the quiz definitely is that by definition, a desert is a region that has greater evaporation than precipitation. They're generally found, naturally deserts are found at north, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitudes. Deserts can also form as a rain shadow, and this is due to mountains, but they're not really considered natural deserts, quote. So really, natural deserts are found at 30 degrees north and south latitude. And they are defined as an area that has greater amount of evaporation than precipitation, which means they have a net loss of water year to year. So deserts basically are areas that have very poorly developed soils, very rich in minerals, but they lack organic material and they certainly lack water. And this is why soils in the deserts tend to be very poor, not very well developed at all. In fact, I would define them as being very poorly developed. Daytime temperatures, however, fluctuate. You can see a daytime ambient air temperature of 100 degrees. In some cases, in the summertime in, in uh, southern parts of the United States, especially in Arizona, Death Valley, for example, the highest recorded temperature, 125 degrees. There's been some unofficial temperatures slightly higher than that. And then deserts could cool down at night. And we talked about this in the early part of the semester when we talked about the weathering of rocks, how Differential temperatures, very extreme warm temperatures in the daytime. Cooler temperatures at night causes rocks to expand and contract. That expansion and contraction is a form of mechanical weathering where the rocks can actually crack. But the soils, despite millions of years, they're extremely poorly developed. A lot of the bushes, these are, this is a creosote desert, which is common in the Mojave Desert. And there's an equal spacing of these particular shrubs, these creosote bushes. And that spacing is basically due to the inavailability of water. And they actually secrete out a poison that keeps other cactus and plants away from them because of the scarcity of water. So sand dunes are certainly parts of deserts. And this is what's neat about deserts is there's a lot of biodiversity in desert. And there's a lot of variation. So there's the desert in the northern, in northern Nevada, which you call the Great Basin Desert. That occupies Nevada, good part of the state of Nevada. The Snoring Desert is found in basically uh, Arizona and goes into Mexico. Parts of it do creep into Eastern California. The Mojave Desert, Barstow, that particular area is the Mojave Desert. The Chihuahua Desert is a desert very south down in Mexico. That, by definition, is a true desert occurring at 30 degrees north latitude. So as it turns out, these soils are rich in minerals, but they lack organic material, they lack water, and you really need water in order to decay plant and animal remains in order to really develop a good soil. So by definition, these are kind of the attributes of, a good, of desert soils. So you can have hilly areas that are rich in minerals. You have areas that are rich in fine grain windblown sand. So you find sand dunes. And so there's a lot of variation within deserts. So they're not really a wasteland as a lot of people unfortunately like to call them. This is an area that's pretty rich biologically and biodiversity. This is actually down in the Sonoran Desert. You have a very taller um, Sora cactus. You have some teddy bear choya cacti. As it turns out, certain cactus will only grow in certain areas. So for example, choya love volcanic rocks. They love that rock that's rich in iron, magnesium, potassium. You don't find very large growths of choya cactus in limestone rocks. Limestones lack iron and magnesium and potassium and mostly calcium carbonate and other cacti survive in those regions pretty easily. So you find areas that are windblown sand. 
This is due to the decomposition of granite over millions of years. The quartz and the felsbars resist the weathering. They have basically been worn down into a very fine sand sized material. And so deserts are found at 30 degrees north and south latitude, north 30 degrees north and south of the equator. But there are other deserts that we're going to talk about that don't fit into the natural scheme of deserts. And those deserts are rain shallow. So I want you to know the distinction between a rain shallow desert and a natural desert. So natural desert basically occurs at 30 degrees north and south latitude. Rain shallow deserts are a little bit different. The precipitation that would normally reach that area is blocked by very tall mountain ranges. And a good example is one in California. The Sierra Nevada Mountains, which basically run down the eastern side of the state of California, block snowfall and precipitation from occurring in Nevada and Utah, creating a rain shallow desert. So Nevada, central Nevada, is a desert because of mountain ranges. It's a little bit too high in latitude to be a true desert. So we, this is a map showing deserts. So this map shows some of the deserts that occur, right? So here's the equator. And so true deserts are going to occur 30 degrees north and south. Actually, this is the equator right here in between this. So true deserts occur north and south of the equator at uh, 30 degrees. And interesting thing about this is that the Sahara Desert is by far probably the best example of a textbook example of a desert. It occurs right there at 30 degrees north latitude. And then you have de deserts like this, like just the Gobi Desert. So the Gobi Desert is completely out of place. It is a rain shallow desert. And so normally, moist air from the Indian Ocean goes across India, across the southern part of the Asian continent. It then follows topography and mountain ranges. It'll actually precipitate. That warm water will actually form clouds. As those clouds become saturated, they'll then drop that moisture in the form of snow or rain, depending on the time of the year. So the Gobi Desert is out of place because the Himalayan mountains are a rain shallow, so they're blocking that warm Indian Ocean moisture from raining in China. And so the Gobi Desert is a desert that's completely out of place. One of the unique deserts is the Panagonian Desert. Again, a rain shallow desert because of the Andes Mountains that blocks the, the moisture. The Andes Mountains are the block. And so in the rain shallow, or the shallow of that, is the Patagonia Desert. This is the driest desert in the world. There are parts of the Patagonia Desert that have not had any measurable rainfall in almost a decade. So that is a pretty remarkable place, the Patagonia Desert. In the western United States, we have the Great Basin Desert, which is mostly Nevada, northern Nevada. Las Vegas, Barstow actually lie within the Mojave Desert. And then Arizona is in the Snoring Desert. And when you go down to Mexico, which is a truly a true desert, the uh, Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico is certainly one of the called the natural deserts. So you can see the distribution of deserts are a nice straight line here. They tend to follow that rule of 30 degrees north and south latitude. Alfred Wegener recognized this. So when he brought up his four original points about continental drift back in 1915, Wegener recognized that deserts occurred at 30 degrees north and south latitude, and yet he found rocks that were formed in deserts way out of place. So Wegener was actually a man way ahead of his time. Unfortunately, he wasn't treated very well, and I think a lot of that had to do to the political environment at the time. I mean, here comes this brilliant guy who is able to take everything that conventional scientists think of the time and turn it upside down. So deserts. Desert plants. So most desert plants have very thick leaves, stems, and they basically have thorns. The primary reason for this is it's a protection measure in order to keep animals from consuming them. So by having thorns, by having very thick structures, instead of thin leaves, they have very thick leaves, that serves as a defense from being consumed by herbivores. So that is a primary defense of the uh, desert plants. So desert plants vary. These are prickly pear cacti, lots of uh, thorns on them. They have really neat fruit that desert tortoise love to eat. They have dragon trees. These tend to be higher. They keep small animals from consuming the leaf structure because they have to climb up. 
And then we have plants that have flowers that bloom only at night, white flowers that bloom at night, and that is primarily has two purposes. One, if they can serve moisture during the daytime, and secondly, because they're a light colored flower, they're going to actually attract the evening pollinators, which in this case are bats. So this is why these, some of these yuccas have a white flower. So adaptation. Since this is such a harsh environment, and since Precipitation varies between almost no precipitation to an average of six inches of rainfall a year. And most of the rain that occurs in desert occurs in very short periods of time. So they might receive one inch of their six inch allotment for the entire year in 30 minutes. Great big thunderstorm in the summertime, lots of rainfall. And so these plants have to really absorb that rainfall. And they have very small leaf structures and they have very small stromata. So last week we talked about a concept called evapotranspiration. This is how moisture is released by plants into the atmosphere. And they do that through a stromata, which is a small opening that allows them to, to actually put oxygen and, and basically water vapor into the atmosphere. Now plants use water as a way to cool down. The same like animals. So animals sweat, we sweat, we have pores. Those pores extract water, that water evaporates, and that's what cools us down. Plants basically do the same thing. They have stromata. But in the case of desert plants, the stromata are very small. Now if you go to the tropical rainforest where there's ample moisture, they have very large stromata. Those plants have very large leaf structures, and they can take advantage of the availability of water where desert plants have had to adapt to that harsh environment. So they have these very small stromata. This prevents water loss and it retains the moisture inside the plant. And this is basically how plants like ocotillo and a lot of the desert plants actually conserve water. So stromata, little holes. And so if you go to the tropics, you'll find that those holes are much larger. You also notice that the leaf structure in tropical plants is much larger, especially in plants like bananas. They have very huge fan leaves. The whole plant's a leaf, basically, where desert plants don't have the availability of water, so they've had to adapt by having the smaller stromata, which conserves the amount of water that they emit into the atmosphere to cool themselves down. And so there's all sorts of plants out in the desert. There's ocotillo. These actually will develop a leaf during a rainfall. When that rainfall stops and the soil dries up, they lose the leaves in order to conserve water. Joshua's are actually a tree, and these are kind of a unique tree. They were put in place in the deserts at the end of the last glaciation. When Joshua tree forests burn, they don't replenish themselves. And the way Joshua trees grow is they'll send a little feeder, and they'll have a smaller plant in front of them, and as that smaller plant matures, then the older Joshua tree will eventually peel off and die. And so when these ecosystems are subject to fire, that Joshua tree forest is destroyed for good. And a lot of reasons that we're seeing fires in deserts right now is because of a lot of invasive, non-indigenous plants that have been brought by basically Europeans. We've introduced these grass species. A lot of it was done for cattle. We, we used to graze a lot of cattle in the deserts. And now since the cattle have been removed from most of the public lands, all these grasses, these invasive species, grow unchecked. They flourish in the early spring when there's ample moisture. And then as conditions tend to dry, those um, invasive species dry up and they're basically kindling for fire. So ecosystems like deserts are now burning because of introduced species. And this is a system, an ecosystem that never burned. So you have Joshua trees, a lot of owls, lots of different varieties of yucca. Um, basically, this is a part of the Choya family, fish hook cactus, a lot of different um, yucca type plants, and it's just amazing the biodiversity of the deserts. And when you start looking at the animals and the plants of the deserts, we're going to look at this later, we'll find that the desert has more biodiversity, and so biodiversity is all the genetic information. So you take all the plants, all the animal species, you take their genetic information and combine it. The desert has much more biodiversity than the rainforest. And that's because desert ecosystems vary. 
The desert isn't just one homogeneous unit. It varies from place to place, and a lot of that variation is basically the result of changes in altitude. So deserts in the springtime can flourish, flowerage when, when there's sufficient rainfall. Desert ecosystems can actually bloom into really pretty flowering systems. Uh, the uh, swarry cactus will bloom in the early spring. They create these little white flowers. They have like a little pot on the end of them. They'll break off and fall to the ground. These are ones that have already dried up. And then there are seeds in those, and this is how they disperse their seeds. When we have ample rainfall, the desert can be a beautiful place. But that beauty is very short-lived because as temperatures increase in the months of May and June, these pretty little flowers are going to basically wilt away because they don't have any more rainfall. The only reason that they're there is that there was good precipitation that occurred from the months of October until March. And depending on what latitude you're at, the deserts of Arizona tend to bloom a little early in March. The deserts on Death Valley will bloom a little bit later in early April. And a lot of it depends on how early spring arrives and how warm or cool it is. As time goes on, though, as we go into the summer months, less available precipitation, and these flowers start to wilt, they start to die back, and eventually you come back to the same place in the summertime, and those pretty flowers are now basically dead. <laughs> And unfortunately, a lot of this material that we see blooming in the deserts today are introduced species. And these species are basically helping the deserts burn. The uh, ecosystem that never burned now burns. And we're doing the same thing in Southern California here. Uh, in California, the monks introduced a neat little plant called mustard weed. It blooms beautifully in the springtime when we had rain. Nice green plant with yellow flowers all over it. So as you drive around, you see all these rolling hills with the yellow flowers. Most of that's mustard weed. Introduced species by monks. They planted it in their gardens, but it took off and it was able to adapt to our California climate. The only unfortunate thing about the mustard weed is in the warmer months of May and June, the mustard weed dries out and it's prone for fire. So the increased incidence in California fires, in a lot of ways, is directly attributed to invasive species that we introduced. A lot of people like to blame it on climate change. Well, because warmer conditions and less rain. And that's not entirely true. There's multiple reasons why we're seeing increases in fires in California rangelands. So introduced non-native species result in range fires. The natural desert an ecosystem that does not naturally burn. But today, our deserts are burning. And we just saw that with that fire that went up over the San Gabriel Mountains into basically the Palmdale area. That is basically a desert. And the reason that that desert burned is because of the invasive non-indigenous species. So even down in the Snoring Desert, down in Arizona, they're all subject to burning because of introduced species. So deserts have a lot of diversity with them, so this is a little bit higher in elevation where you, hear, you have some yucca brava folia, and then you'll have some trees. These are juniper trees, and you'll see a mixture of succulent plants, cactus, incorporated within some trees. Lower deserts, like down in Tucson, have these beautiful swore cactus that thrive in the spring. You see them get this nice apple green color. And then in the months of June, July, August, when temperatures become warmer, they kind of almost build a film over them and they become less brilliant green and more of a darker green. And that is to have less photosynthesis and to conserve water. So when you photosynthesize, when you produce sugars, you actually use a lot of water. And so plants will kind of shut down during extremely warm months because of the lack of water. So desert animals have adapted to the changing system also. So a lot of these ecosystems have changed due to climatic changes. So climate has changed in the past 12,000 years. It started cooling, or actually the last glaciation ended about 12,000 years ago. And from 12,000 years ago until now, climate has been warming. And a lot of these ecosystems have adapted to that gradual warming. Uplifted mountain ranges, such as Sierra Nevada Mountains, 
Actually, you can create deserts. So the plants and the animals that inhabit these ecosystems have gone through a great deal of adaptation, and which is really neat. So Charles Darwin talked a lot about how animal species and plants can adapt to changing environments. It all comes down to survival of the fittest. So most of the uh, animals that live in the deserts, for the most part, are nocturnal. Especially in the summer, you will not see a whole lot of life in the desert during the daytime in the summer. As the sun set and it cools down, a lot of animals come out. They come out feeding. A lot of the uh, desert uh, plants and animals have adapted to the very harsh daytime temperatures and the cooler evening temperatures. So reptiles, such as lizards, have to regulate their body temperature by basking in the sun when they're cold. When they start to overheat, they have to go into the shade. And in the wintertime, a lot of these species basically have a tendency to hibernate. So deserts are the, are the home of many living organisms. You know, they have variety with plants and animal species and have greater biodiversity than basically rainforest. And we'll get into that into a little minute here. So here are some of the uh, important species of the, of the deserts. Desert tortoise, which are now a threatened species, primarily threatened because its critical habitat is being encroached on by urbanization. Major cities like Phoenix, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada, are basically building right in prime desert tortoise habitat. In addition, we are now building huge solar farms and wind generators that are putting a further impact on desert tortoise. There's the horned lizards, which are basically also threatened. They like the sandy desert and valleys. Again, this is where a lot of development is taking place. And we'll talk about this little creature here. These actually glow in the dark, so if you want to hunt scorpions in the evening, go out with a black light and they fluoresce a bright green color. And scorpions, though, have adapted very well to humans as we develop into the critical habitat of the scorpion. It basically has moved into people's homes, made itself at home. So it's done very well at adaptation. So a lot of species depend on the plants of the desert, how owls basically will barrel their way into sword cactus, and they basically have adapted to this very harsh environment. These owls basically spend the daytime in these cactus, coming out very early evening and going back into those burrows in the morning. And you can hear them howl at, 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 in the evening, and then they start talking to each other in the early morning hours as they start to roost and nest for the night. Interesting species of, this, of the deserts is this particular lizard here. This is the only poisonous des desert species that we have. It's a Gila monster. It has this famous color of black and red. So whenever you see an insect or an animal that is black and red or, or yellow and black, this generally is a warning that they have that they're venomous and the Gila monsters certainly are and this is another species that daytime they'll hibernate they'll go in the cracks of rocks and they come out at night and they do this because it's just too hot in the deserts especially in the midsummer deserts have the whole ecosystem just like any other biological community you have your primary producers which are your plants you have your primary consumers which are the insects and then you have the lizards which feed the insects, the hawks that feed off the lizards, and so forth. So you have basically a tiered ecosystem in, de in the desert community, just like you would find in any other biological community. And so the desert is no different, going from primary producers to primary consumers, to secondary consumers, and then tertiary consumers. And so there's this whole food web. And so at night, kid foxes come out, and they're basically a secondary consumer. They will consume things like rabbits and uh, small rodents. Bighorn sheep are at the very top of the food chain. And these are species that migrate up and down mountains, depending on temperature. So in the wintertime, they'll go to lower valleys. And during the hot summer months, they'll go up to the higher elevations. So they're kind of a migratory species. And then the scorpions. 
they have very well adapted to the urban setting. In fact, in Phoenix, Arizona, the scorpions have become a problem. They will go into people's homes. They'll actually crawl inside people's shoes. So when you wake up in the morning in Arizona, in Phoenix, you have to make sure your shoes don't have scorpions in them. I've seen people with them in ceiling lights and crawling off walls. I know one lady walked into a bathroom and right there on the, kid, on the counter was a great big scorpion. They can be um, harmful to very young infants or children and older people. Uh, people who, you know, are in good physical shape. It might make them a little nauseous, but they do have a nasty, deadly little sting. And people actually in, in Arizona, they actually you go to a supermarket, a, a fast food, 7-Eleven, Circle K, they sell, in the summertime especially, these little fluorescent lights. You can walk around at night and find the scorpions because they glow a great big bright, kind of like a green color. Snakes. A lot of snakes. The snakes have kind of got a bad rap, though, because rattlesnakes are more afraid of us than we are of them. And I think Hollywood has done an excellent job of demonizing the snakes. Most rattlesnakes will flee. They will basically take off. So when you're hiking, you make enough noise, they're going to get out of your way. It's the people who try and catch the snake. It's the people who try and kill the snakes more often are actually bit. And again, this is a species that has adapted itself to desert environments. It basically has the coloring, so it blends right in. So you have to be careful when you're hiking. It's not to come up on a sidewinder or diamondback rattler. There's actually a sub-variety of diamondbacks called the Mojave Green. It's basically a greenish color. And most snakes, when they bite you, they either affect your respiratory system or your nervous system. The Mojave Green, which is found in the Mojave Desert, Barstow area, Victorville, attacks both your nervous system and your respiratory system. And it's very fatal. Railroad workers who work out in the middle of the deserts, in the Mojave Desert, actually carry EpiPens with them in case they're bit, because there's not enough time to get those people to the hospital if they're bitten by the Mojave Green. In a, one place called SEMA, it's right at the top of a hill, and they all, the railroad guys would get out and check the brakes at night. And they actually had to be extremely careful. They had to, they had to actually light the area up. So in the middle of the desert, this is railroad track that's well lit because of these snakes. A lot of reptiles, basically reptiles cannot regulate their heat the way you and I can, the way animals can. They have to depend on sunlight. When it's too hot, they have to go inside. When they're cold, they can come back out and sun. There's some really neat lizards in the desert, such as the uh, geckos. And these are kind of rare. Again, they're kind of being threatened because they like to occupy low valleys, sandy soils, and washes. And this is typically where urbanization has taken place. So even the leopard gecko is greatly being infringed upon and threatened. So rain shadow deserts. Let's change gears for just a little bit. These are the deserts that the textbook definition of are not natural. And they are caused because of geology. So uplifting the mountain ranges in a lot of areas has basically created a desert on the opposite side of the prevailing wind. So a good example of that is in California we have the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Our storm patterns track from the west to the east. So they start on the western coast, California, and they move inland across the United States. But large mountain ranges like the Sierra Nevada and even the San Gabriel Mountains this, and the uh, San Bernardino Mountains, they act as rain shallows. So as that warm air moist rises, it cools, it condenses, it forms clouds. Most of the precipitation, most of the snowpack occurs on the windward side of the mountain. So now as that air mass goes back over the mountain and starts to descend down into the valleys, that air mass does two things. It tends to warm up in temperature and it also tends to dry, creating deserts on the back side of these mountains. So this is a basically a drawing of how this works. Warm, moist air rises. So for every thousand feet that you increase in elevation, in general, the temperature will decrease by about seven degrees. 
And so as this temperature starts to decrease, cooler air can hold less moisture than warm air. So the result is, is that, that moisture starts to condense, form clouds. Most of the precipitation is going to occur on the windward side of the mountain. So in the case of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, most of the precipitation occurs on our side of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, on the west side. As that air mass rises, it starts to warm now, as it starts to go back down. So it rises, it cools, dumps its snow, goes back down the back side of the mountain. As this air descends, for every thousand feet you now go down in elevation, you start to warm by seven to eight degrees. So by the time you get to the low valleys, the air mass is warm and it is dry because warm air holds much more moisture, but it's not concentrated. It's more spread out. And this is where we get the rain shell, and this is why areas on the opposite side of the mountains are basically dry and warm. And so we see this throughout the world. So here's the prevailing winds. This is why the Patagonia Desert is the driest place in the world. The prevailing winds come across the Pacific Ocean. They then go up the Andes Mountains. All the precipitation takes place on the west side of the Andes Mountains. By the time that air mass snow goes up and over the mountain, starts to go back down the mountain to the Patagonia Desert, basically it's warm, dry air mass, and the Patagonia Desert doesn't get any precipitation. Now, up around the great rainforest of Brazil, the opposite is true. So the prevailing winds here are from east to west. So this area here receives all the precipitation, and which is good because that's why we have the rainforest of Brazil. And so when that rainforest is receiving all this moisture, as that air mass goes up over the Andes Mountains and goes back down into Chile, the Atacama Desert is formed because it is also a rain shell. The big islands of Hawaii. So most of the islands of Hawaii, they have two sides. They have the leeward side and the windward side. The windward side is where the winds bring in the moisture. Precipitation occurs on one side of the mountain. The other side of the mountain, you basically have a desert. And this is really true, especially the big island of Hawaii. So when we think of Hawaii, we think of tropical rainforests and hula skirts and all sorts of, you know, palm trees with coconuts. And, and that's true for part of Hawaii, but the other half of the island is actually a desert. And I could bring you over to this part of the Big Island. You'll see snow in the mountains. You will see rangeland that looks like you would think you would be in Montana or someplace. And this is, a, again, because of the rain shadow effect. So here, the island on one side, on the, on the windward side, is very moist. On the leeward side, dry and warm. So this rain shadow effect basically can occur even in islands. And so on the... Uh, back side of the big island of Hawaii, you find grasslands that look like you're in Montana. Big cattle ranches are on, that, on the big island of Hawaii. And so in the western United States here, this is the Great Basin Desert. This desert basically is a rain shallow desert because of the Sierra Nevada mountains that go along the eastern side of California. And those mountains do continue up in Oregon, but we don't call them the Sierra Nevada. This yellow area here is the Great Basin Desert, and that desert is there because it's a rain shallow desert. So is the Mojave Desert. So down here where Las Vegas is, Barstow, the, basically the Mojave Desert is a result of the San Bernardino Mountains and the San Gabriel Mountains blocking the precipitation. When you get down here into the Sonoran Desert, this desert is more of a natural desert because this is right about 30 degrees north latitude, so this is more of a natural desert. And then the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico is one of the textbook examples of a desert. So in the United States, our storms kind of track from the west across the east. So as you go to the eastern United States and the states like Illinois, Missouri, and Arkansas, you get a lot more precipitation. The western United States receives far less precipitation. The western United States has a lot of deserts, and they're all rain shallow deserts. So elevation and biodiversities. So I said earlier that the deserts have more biodiversity than the rainforest, and they do. And the reason that they have more biodiversity than the rainforest is because of elevation. 
So Death Valley National Park, I take my students there, my historical geology students on a field trip every spring. Of course, this will be the second spring where we haven't done that field trip because of the COVID-19. Let's get a vaccine out, please, and let's get back to normal. So Death Valley, we will be standing in Death Valley in April. It'll be 85 degrees, dry, warm, and yet our elevation is 283 feet below sea level. So we're below sea level. Look across the valley and look at Telescope Peak, almost 11,000 feet in elevation, snow on it. So as you go from the desert and you go up in each elevational increment, you see a difference in temperature, you see a difference in precipitation, you see a difference in plants, and certainly you're going to see a difference in animals that are going to use those plants for survival. So the desert has more biodiversity. So each incremental increase in elevation results in plant communities that have adapted to those specific conditions. Those conditions at that particular elevation, which provides a particular temperature and moisture regime. And then the animal species are going to adapt to the plant types. And this is why you find more biodiversity in the deserts than you do in the rainforest. So let's see how that happens. This is Death Valley. And this sign is right at sea level. So when you go out into the lower part of the valley here, you're actually below sea level. This is Telescope Peak. Now this picture obviously wasn't taken when there was snow at Telescope Peak, but often in the spring, early spring, you'll see snow on these mountains. So there's, this is like almost 11,000 feet. This is below sea level. So as you go from this desert up into the hills and go further up into the mountains, you'll see a difference in temperature, a difference in plant types, and therefore a difference in animals. So here we are at the very bottom of the valley, dry pan, nothing's growing here. Go up and you start seeing yucca, bravifolia plants. They, these occur at a little bit higher elevation. A little bit higher, you'll start to see some Palo Verde, some of the ski trees, incorporated with some cacti. So this is a little higher elevation. A little bit higher yet, you'll start to see more prominent bushes taken over. A little bit more um, dense foliage, still some succulents. Go even higher yet, to about 4,000 feet in elevation, you'll see the Joshua trees. Completely different bushes. You're not going to see creosote bushes. You won't see as many succulent, not as much cacti. You're getting into the plane where now trees and with root systems are going to be the dominant species. Go a little higher, you start to see juniper. Go higher up, and the higher you go, you more dense vegetation, more trees until you find pine trees, ponderosa pines at the higher elevations. So this is actually at Wrightwood. It's kind of interesting, you're looking here at the high mountain and the pine trees. Down in the valley here, in Palmdale, this is a desert. And so there's so much biodiversity between this desert and these pine trees. And this is why these deserts have such a high degree of biodiversity. All right, let's look at green energy, renewable energy, and let's kind of look at what's happening to our deserts really recently. I think, again, this is a part due to Hollywood and TV and just the kind of mindset of people is that they think the desert's a wasteland. And it really isn't. I think it's a really beautiful place. And so green energy or renewable energy is actually encroaching onto the desert. And a lot of this is because of government subsidies. So large energy companies like Duke will come to California and Nevada, Arizona, and they'll build huge wind farms. They'll put in large solar plants. And they'll use thousands of acres to do that. And they basically completely mow down the desert. They encroach on critical habitat. And they basically destroy the desert. And I think a lot of what the Bureau of Land Management doing, is doing right now is all part of a double standard. 20 years ago, if you read anything that the BLM was putting out, they were against cattle ranchers. They said, we can't have cows on Bureau of Land Management land because those cows are directly impacting the desert tortoise. We can't have that. 
We can't have people out on dirt bikes because they're tearing up the desert pavement. They're destroying the desert. So they've enforced that. And now recently, they've turned 180 degrees. And so those very same areas where they threw the cattle ranchers off, they told the dirt bikers, you can't ride here, you can't play here. They've allowed the solar companies to come in and just mow down the deserts and put in these huge solar plants. And so cattle grazing, off-road vehicle use, was infecting desert species. And so there's kind of a double standard here. And we're seeing this a lot in our society lately. We're seeing a lot of double standards. So what's occurring, and this is actually the big uh, solar plant of Ivan Paul. These aren't photovoltaic cells. These are actually mirrors. And these mirrors focus towards this tower, which has a brine solution in it that becomes superheated. It basically then is used to turn a turbine to generate electricity. As they were building this, I was with some people, we were kind of protesting this, we were against this project. And we noticed that over the back side of the mountain, they're building, uh, there's a road and something going on. So we went out there and investigate. And sure enough, they were building a gas pipeline to the solar plant. That's right. This solar plant is actually fed by natural gas. So in other words, they're burning natural gas because they said that the sun isn't hot enough. That all these mirrors doesn't produce enough heat to adequately run this plant. So they have to supplement the plant by using natural gas. They kind of keep that a big secret. It's one of the biggest lies that's out there. So this is basically a solar plant that basically has mowed down the desert. This was a prime habitat for desert tortoises. They went in and did a lot of the desert tortoise studies in the wintertime. Well, guess what desert tortoise do in the wintertime? The reptiles. They hibernate. So they walk across the desert. Oh, no, no desert tortoises. No, it's fine. They actually captured a lot of the desert tortoises. They then put them into a holding pen and they wound up euthanizing them. They killed them. So isn't it amazing that the government agencies that were trying to protect the desert are now responsible for destroying the desert. So this is all done because of big solar. So this is actually in the El Dorado Valley. So this is right along uh, Highway 95 between Boulder City and Searchlight going down towards Lothan, Nevada. This is a huge solar project that is just spreading across the El Dorado Valley. Again, another area of critical tortoise habitat. The irony is that the US-95 highway goes through this solar farm. They put all the way down the highway a tortoise fence that literally cost a million dollars. Then they came in and destroyed the tortoise's habitat. So no need for the fence anymore. And this, in large part, is being fed by government subsidies. So this is how these, this works. So they told the dirt bikers, no, nah, can't ride your dirt bikes here. We've got to protect this guy. But then the big solar companies come out here and they literally have just mowed over everything. And so these are the planned solar projects for just a corridor in Nevada. And they're just basically encroaching on a lot of desert areas. And a lot of this is basically government subsidized. So it's corporate welfare. The corporations are basically receiving government money in order to finance these projects. And companies like Duke Energy come out here. They say, okay, we built this big solar farm. Because they built this green energy solar farm, they now get a permit and the right to pollute out of their coal-fired power plant over in Connecticut. Literally, that's what's going on. It's called an offset. You put in some solar projects in the desert, we're going to give you an offset. We're going to give you the right to pollute over in the eastern United States. And to me, that's a double standard, and there's a lot of irony there. So, Aldi and Ivan Paul here, you know, is this saving the planet? That's one of the questions that we're beginning to ask. Is green energy really green? We're destroying, we destroyed these uh, five square miles of pristine desert. We killed over 130 desert tortoises in the process. Um, basically, um, Bighorn sheep critical habitat has been impacted and they basically wiped out the entire desert ecosystems. Just wiped it out. 
And despite protests from a variety of groups, these projects get ramrodded and pushed through. So wind energy, a very large government subsidies to big energy companies. So corporate welfare checks basically is basically what's going on. And it gives you the right to pollute on the East Coast. Pollution credits for coal-fired power plants by very big large companies like Duke Energy. And this is the further irony that they're into. Each one of these wind projects, each one of these turbines themselves, so each wind turbine costs about $3 million to construct. These are very huge things. I've watched them construct these. So out of the $3 million, about a million dollars of it is put up by the company, Duke Energies, for example. The other million dollars is put up by the state, California, Nevada, Arizona, depending on the state. And the other million dollars is brought by the federal government. So imagine that you're going to build something that costs $3 million, and you only have to put up a third of that, 33%, because the rest of, it's, rest of it's going to be subsidized. Plus you get to ta take the tax rate off, the amortization, the depreciation, and you get the right to pollute someplace else because you put in this green energy. So how green is green energy? The money. That's what's really green about it. So am I against solar and wind? No. I'm in favor. I'm in favor of green energy. Except it has its place. Why not put the solar panels where we need them? Why not take all the large format stores like Targets and Walmarts and malls and schools and why not put those rooftops full of solar panels and use that electricity where we need it, right in the urban areas. The irony is that we're building these solar plants and these wind farms out in the middle of the desert. Now what do we do to get the electricity from the desert to the cities where we need it? We have to build more transmission lines. So we actually start to fragment the deserts. And species, critical habitat encroachment, critical habitat fragmentation, we're actually taking large areas that species need to survive and we're fragmenting it. We're cutting in little blocks and we're saying, okay, we're going to put this little square over here for the desert tortoises and this one over here for the bighorn sheep and everything else we're going to develop. So habitat encroachment, habitat fragmentation, these are the things that are really driving a lot of species into the threatened species list and a lot of them into the endangered species list. So alternatives, rooftop solar. However, the incentive is low due to the lack of large-scale government financial kickbacks. That's why there's not an incentive to put it. When I first started teaching at Golden West Campus, we had a good environmental club. I had some really good active students. Brilliant students. And we actually proposed that we put solar panels on all the parking lots of Golden West College. And that way the students would have shaded parking. You'd come out in the warm months and your car would be nice and cool. And they said no, because of the maintenance of it. They didn't want to deal with the main maintenance of it. So here's a good example of a parking lot that's solar panel. I mean, this makes a lot of sense, especially in environments where there's a lot of sun. You can park your car in the shade. You come out from class. You don't have to worry about using your air conditioner as much because your car isn't, you know, 120 degrees. Imagine in Phoenix, Arizona, where the daytime temperature gets to be 117, 118. The inside temperature of a car in an open parking lot, 150 degrees. You keep it covered. 30 degree differential in temperature. Doesn't take as much air conditioning. Doesn't take as much gasoline. It makes sense to put these solar panels in the cities where we can best utilize it. But, you know, we're kind of fighting some big corporate interests and big government interests. And, um, you know, it's kind of a frustrating process. I've kind of been with this project. I've been with this group and, you know, been for the past five years. And I've just seen some of the amazing things. And when I mean amazing, I'm being sarcastic. It's really terrible what they're doing. So let's look at the last aspect of the semester. We'll end on a good note. <laughs> on a naturally occurring thing called oasis. So an oasis. Water in a desert ecosystem that's out of place. That's basically what an oasis is. And they basically occur due to groundwater discharging along a geological 
structure like a fault or a change in the geological structure or rock layers. This is why we see oases. So they're often referred to as a spring or often referred to as artesian wells. So this is what water that's naturally coming out of the ground. And when Irvine first came into Irvine, it was basically an area of rangeland, there were natural springs. And that's why Irvine chose this area as his ranch because of the availability of water. As more and more farmers started moving in and the area started to develop, we started drilling wells. We lowered the water table and those springs dried up. Well, let's look at some of these oases. So here's an oasis out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. This one actually emerges because of the change in geology, different rock types. So often if you have a sandstone and a shell come together, shell won't allow water to penetrate it, and water will flow up through these shells. So you have the, here's an oasis out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. There's one in our backyard called Palm Springs. So the reason that Palm Springs was developed, was formed into the golf course paradise that it is today, was because of springs. So natural water was rising up. And so the early settlers that were coming across the California desert discovered water at Palm Springs. And so in the background of Palm Springs, so Palm Springs down the valley, in the background is the San Jacinto Mountains. These mountains receive snowfall on them. That snow is never actually going to melt. A lot of it's going to infiltrate and go into the rock, into the dirt of the mountain, and become groundwater. That groundwater is then going to flow underground from the high elevation to the low elevation. The reason that that groundwater emerges at Palm Springs is because that groundwater hits a fault. One of the branches of the San Andreas Fault goes right through Palm Springs. That's right, Palm Springs sits right on top of the San Andreas Fault. So here's the San Andreas Fault. And so the irony is, is that a lot of these communities, such as Desert Hot Springs, San Bernardino, Palmdale, a lot of these communities were started, people started settling there because there was water. And the reason that there was water is because mountains because of the huge change in elevation, we're putting a lot of pressure on the water systems. When those water systems hit the fault, they would follow the fault and emerge the springs. So here's Palm Springs, a lot of faults out here. We got the Garnet Hills Fault, we have the main San Andreas Fault, the Banning Mission Creek Fault. So a lot of faults out here, and this is why the Palm Springs area had so many artesian and springs and oases. And basically it was an oasis. So when the early settlers, the pioneers, went through that valley, that high drought valley, they found this area of palm trees and fig trees, and they discovered there was water emerging out of the ground. What a place to live, right? Boom. So we'll start a city here. They didn't realize at the time that they were basically around top of San Andreas Fault. So there's a huge increase in elevation. This is that tramway that goes up to the mountain. So down here, this is the valley. Here's the development of Palm Springs. So you have a very low-lying valley. And this is really pretty close to sea level, so this is a very low elevation. As you go up into the uh, Santa Central Mountains, you go up in the elevation, we have snow. That snow is actually going to melt in the uh, spring and the summer. A lot of that is going to infiltrate into the ground. And then, because of the pressure from the high elevation to the low elevation and the fault, the groundwater hits the fault. And so these palm springs, when the early settlers went through palm springs, that's why they named it Palm Springs, because there were palm trees all over the place and water. And so what a great place to build golf courses, which is basically what we've done. So now the springs don't flow naturally anymore. As people moved in, there was an increased demand for water and golf courses and little ponds in those golf courses. And the springs have since then dried up because we basically lowered the water table. And so the supply from the mountains and the use the use exceeded the supply, so the springs dried up, and now basically all this is being fed by a series of wells that they have drilled down to extract the water that used to come up naturally. And this is the end of Desert Ecosystems. So, and this also closes out our semester, and we are now completed.